In this lecture, we'll cover synapses and the action potential of a neuron. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to define synapse, neurotransmitter, resting potential, action potential, depolarization, and hyperpolarization. Be able to list membrane components active in creating a membrane potential and creating an action potential. List the steps that occur at a synapse. List the steps in the formation and propagation of an action potential, including the self-propagation and the refractory period, and be able to define saltatory conduction. First off, let's look at the events that occur at a synapse. A synapse is at the end of an axon where that axon either meets a dendrite of another neuron or the cell body of another neuron. And what happens is an action potential will arrive at the axon terminal. This will have traveled down from the presynaptic cell all the way down to the end of this axon. There will then be a calcium influx causing a binding of calcium to these vesicles full of neurotransmitters. These vesicles full of neurotransmitters will bind to this membrane of the axon and release the neurotransmitters into this synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters will travel across the synaptic cleft, which is a very short distance, and bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell. What happens when these neurotransmitters bind to these synapses? Well, they can cause an influx of different ions. If they cause an influx of chloride ions, which have a negative charge, this will cause a hyperpolarization. This is where the negative charge, which is normally at the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts, more on that later, will become something like negative 80 millivolts. This is hyperpolarized because it is more polarized than the resting potential. There could also be the depolarization produced by these neurotransmitters binding to the receptors, causing a certain amount of sodium to go through. And if this sodium goes through, this will depolarize it. Putting positive charges through this membrane will cause the resting potential of negative 70 to be changed to, say, negative 60 when there is a depolarization caused by a neurotransmitter binding to a receptor and causing an influx of sodium. We will look at summation and something called threshold a little bit later on. But for now, I want you to look at those neurotransmitters and ask, after they bind to a receptor, what happens to them? Well, they can be released into the synaptic cleft and bind to the receptor, yes, and then they might diffuse away. This is rare because they're very reusable. They might be degraded and digested. That's actually pretty easy. These are very easily broken down or they might be retaken up by the neuron ahead of it. So if those are retaken up by the neuron, the presynaptic neuron, then they can be reused. And we're gonna look at that later on when we talk about different drugs and how they affect synapses. Well, we talked a bit about potential, but let's think about the different types of potential and why do these neurons have charges? Well, there is something called a resting potential, and the resting potential is the charge across the neuron when it is at rest. You'll find that this resting potential is also true for many other cells, including muscle cells, which have a resting potential. In all of these, it's pretty much the same deal. You have a sodium-potassium pump. You may remember the sodium-potassium ATPase as an example of active transport. What happens is three sodium are loaded into the sodium-potassium ATPase, which is a transmembrane protein, and this transmembrane protein will then take up ATP and convert it to ADP and phosphate. This uses cellular energy to move those sodium out of the cell. It moves them out of the cell because normally there's a positive charge outside the cell. It takes energy to move positively charged molecules into a positively charged environment. They are going up their concentration gradient instead of down, so it takes energy. Potassium is then going to come back in, and when this potassium comes back in, it's going to bind to the sodium-potassium pump, and two potassium are going to come back in. Now, this is going to mean there's going to be more potassium in the cell and more sodium out of the cell. There are things called potassium leak channels, which allow the potassium to go back out as it wishes. There's also something called sodium leak channels, which allow a very limited amount of sodium to leak back in. The net result of all of these things is a more positive charge outside the cell and a more negatively charged inside the cell. And that will be about negative 70 millivolts. So we can see here the sodium potassium pump putting three positively charged sodium ions out of the cell. 
and then allowing two positively charged potassium ions into the cell. That makes a higher concentration of potassium in the cell than out of the cell, and the potassium will want to go out of the cell. The leak channels allow potassium to go out of the cell as much as it wants. The problem, though, is the positive charge on those potassium is going to mean it will be harder for the potassium to go out because it's positively charged outside. And this creates an electrochemical gradient that we call a resting potential. Changes in the potential can occur, and we're going to look at a couple of the different options. One is a depolarization. This is anything that will make that resting potential of negative 70 millivolts less negative, and that's a depolarization. A hyperpolarization is anything that makes it more negative. There are different types of depolarization. One is a graded potential where you, it's less than an action potential. These can add up to something called summation. When two graded potentials add together, they'll reach a certain threshold at which they trigger an action potential. Action potentials are whenever you have those graded potentials go above the threshold, there is a spike and a very strong depolarization called an action potential that we're going to look at next. Here is what these look at on a graph. You have a resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. There can be different types. There can be depolarization. That's what it looks like. Hyperpolarization, that is what that one looks like. Two depolarizations occurring in a row cause summation where they are adding together or summing. If these reach that negative 50 millivolts threshold, there is an action potential. Well, what is an action potential? An action potential is when the voltage gated sodium channels are going to allow a lot of sodium back in. If the voltage of the cell membrane is negative 50 millivolts or anything more positive than that, the sodium you remember is at a high concentration outside the cell and is positively charged. So allowing it all in is going to make the cell become very much more positive very rapidly and that is what the sodium wants to be, is in. There are also voltage-gated potassium channels, which allow the potassium out. If the voltage across the cell membrane is positive, potassium channels will open and let all the potassium out. And at this point, the potassium is going down its concentration gradient out of the cell, and also down its voltage gradient out of the cell. Both of these channels are open and they automatically shut after a short period. Here we can see a cell at resting potential and then you, it'd be before this threshold. And when that threshold is reached, you see the depolarization. The sodium channels are going to open and the sodium is going to rush in, causing a positive charge across the membrane. Then there is repolarization as the potassium comes out. You can see these little lines here. You see the orange line for the sodium going out, potassium going out here after the membrane becomes positive. When those potassium are going out, you end up getting a negative charge again. So you see that kind of overshoot and that re-establishment of the resting potential as the sodium potassium pump is going to put the sodium back out and the potassium back in. So this is all going back to a resting potential due to the action of the sodium potassium ATPase. This charge will actually travel down an axon because allowing the sodium in causes a positive charge. That positive charge is then going to trigger more voltage gated sodium channels down further down the axon. So this is how that voltage gated sodium channels cause more voltage gated sodium channels to open and this will propagate down an axon as the sodium goes in. It's much faster than simple diffusion but this is a little slower than a simple electrical impulse and this will not go backwards because it's something called the refractory period. You may remember how I said the voltage-gated sodium channels and the voltage-gated potassium channels both close after a short amount of time, and that's going to be called the refractory period. Obviously, more sodium can't go in when the sodium's already going in. You can't open the already open voltage-gated sodium channels, and that's the absolute refractory period. They will shut automatically, and that automatic shutting can be reopened if there's a strong enough potential, and that's called the relative refractory period. And what happens is this means the charge will go down in one direction. As it started trying to go back, it would encounter 
voltage-gated sodium channels that are in their absolute refractory period. So it can only go in one direction. How can we make it go faster? Well, this is something called myelination. You insulate the wire of the axon, essentially, with Schwann cells. These are cells that are full of fat, and this is, caused, is called a myelin sheath. And this myelin sheath goes around the axon it makes axons actually white colored because fat is white. And what happens is the impulse will jump between one node of Ranvier and another. So instead of going, going down the axon, it'll actually jump. So think about this as someone shuffling their feet as fast as they can across the classroom versus bounding across the classroom step by step. That's essentially how the charge propagates down the axon. We look at nerves, we actually see bundles of myelinated axons. We see a lot of this in the spinal cord. There's a lot of myelinated axons going down towards their synapses. In the brain, we can see these myelinated axons as white matter. So that white matter is actually the axons you're looking at. And each of those is going towards a synapse where they will interface with another cell, causing it to depolarize, hyperpolarize, and maybe if the summation is correct, have an action potential.